Praise the Lord and welcome to Friday Night Alive. Hey, you made it. I pray that you had a blessed week, a prosperous week, but maybe it's been a challenging week. And if that's the case, you not only succeeded in surviving and overcoming the challenge, but I believe that even in the midst of the challenge, God has done something whether you realize it or not. You know, that's the incredible thing. We got to realize that God works even when we're sleeping. And when I say works, I don't mean God gets off the throne, puts on a tool belt and goes to work. I mean that he works in our heart and in our life. Maybe it's a passage of scripture that you've been reading and you've been meditating on. Well, those are seeds that you're planting within the soil of your soul. And as you sleep, guess what happens? those seeds begin to grow and be nurtured and, and develop into what God wants to do in your life. So God is working even when you don't realize it. I'm just so glad that you're with me tonight, whether you're on the live stream or the rebroadcast. Hey, sit back for the next few moments and open your heart and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to teach you, to lead you, to guide you, to show you something that you haven't seen before. Hey, before we get into the word, why don't we say a word of prayer tonight? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, help us to realize that, Lord, that every time we invoke that name, declare that name, all of hell stands at attention. Why? Because the scripture declares that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So it's in that name that I pray for that one that may be hurting, struggling, maybe physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, and you're just not in a place of peace. I pray that tonight you would minister to them, touch them, and open their heart in such a way that they would say, I could have never done it. It had to be God in my life and give you the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray your blessings upon the program. Amen. Well, we're going to continue what we've been talking about, and I got my little furry grand dog here that I'm babysitting for a couple of days. So uh, we're going to go with the flow with him. So far, so good. And uh, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Come on, somebody. I love some of those sayings. I'd love to get a hold of a book that just has all those sayings and how they came about and who the author was of the story. But we're going to continue what we've been talking about. That just because you have an Ishmael does not mean that God has forgot your Isaac. Sometimes we feel because of our own failure, our own sin, our own missing the mark, we feel that that has disqualified us. Have you ever been there? Have you ever dragged some baggage with you along your life that you feel like because of that failure, that mistake, it has literally marked me for life? I'm not qualified. Well, let me tell you, the good news is you're not qualified. You're exactly right. But the even better news than the good news is that Jesus knew that and that was the purpose in which he came and he lived and he hung on that cross, bled on that cross, was beaten prior to the cross to the point of death. Do you know that in many instances, men who suffered the penalty of those lashes striking them, ripping the flesh from their body. Many of them died during that process, but it was after that process that Jesus not only was nailed to the cross, he had to carry his cross down through the streets of Jerusalem. The Via Della Rosa, way of suffering and pain. Why did someone do that for us? Because of the love of God that constrained them that they had no other choice. Jesus was moved and motivated by love. Not because of what we were presenting to him 
as far as our life, our actions, but it was from his perspective. We are God's creation. As you look at the beauty around the world, there's some beautiful places to be seen. The most beautiful creation of God, I'm going to tell you where you can see it. You don't have to travel. You don't have to spend any money. All you have to do to see the most beautiful, valuable creation of God is to go and to look in the mirror. Why? Because God loves you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And my friend, when we begin to understand the level and the depth and the breadth of God's love for us, it's overwhelming at times. He loves us when we don't love ourselves. He loves us when we don't love him. He loves us when we do the right thing and he loves us when we do the wrong thing. You think of one person on the planet, one lifestyle on the planet, that rubs you just the wrong way. Those commercials with same-sex people and you see that and you turn it off? Can I tell you that God loves that person just as much as he loves you? Now, he doesn't love the sin. He doesn't love the doesn't love that, but he loves the person. And oh, if we as Christian believers could ever see through all of that sin and understand that within that mess is a creation of God that has the gifts and the talents of God within them. When we see things like God sees them and understand that God just loves people. Now, will a person reap what they sow? Again, is God pleased with certain lifestyles, actions, and sins? Listen, there are things going on in churches that God's not pleased with. (laughs) There are attitudes, criticisms, judgments that God is not pleased with, but he loves the person. We understand God creates and penetrates through all way will begin to reach and to harvest the harvest. Let's get into this tonight. Just because you have an Ishmael, Ishmael is the producing of a sin. It's, it's, it's more than I did something, Lord, I'm so sorry. No, it is doing something that'll follow you all of your life or for a significant period of time. An Ishmael could be a jail sentence, a prison sentence, a a, a jail sentence or or a, uh, an Ishmael could be the product of our actions and things that we have done that manifest in such a way that we can't just get rid of them. You know, some sins, you can just say, Father, forgive me. I'm so sorry. I confess it to you. I repent of it. And that is the typical way of dealing with sin. It is not, I'm sorry, but it's repentance. It's a change of heart, change of mind, change of direction. Literally, you say, you know what? This is the wrong direction. I'm going to start heading in the other direction. I'm going to start heading in the direction that I know God wants me to go. It's it's change, change of heart, change of change of action, change of thought. But how many times as a believer have we maybe been guilty of criticizing someone else for whatever reason? You know, God is just as displeased with that as he is with the people that you see and the things that you see going on in the world. Listen, the world is our harvest field, not the church, the world. The impact that you as a believer, a child of God, a Christian, makes 
wherever you, whoever you meet, whoever God gives you the opportunity to minister to, that is the harvest field. That it's not the church. It's the people that you meet. That, going back to what I, I have said before, when you get, you should say, God, use me. Lead me. Spirit, be sensitive. Something that I should talk to. Something I should say. And when you like that, they are powerful. They see the result probably 24 hours or less. There's not been one I've gotten up use me, hoping to be a blessing. I mean, today I had somebody that me wanted to talk to me, a business opportunity. I ended up praying with the person, coming into agreement with them on the phone. Someone I didn't even know. They were in Honduras and I was in Florida. Why? Because I I have learned through the years how the Holy Spirit works in my life that I can sense Him. It's like a flutter. It's like a uh, angle almost. It's uh, I'm explaining it in the physical, but spiritual thing. And I just learned to go with the flow. Years ago, I had to press through fear. I had to press through the opposition of my own insecurities and my own, uh, in my mind, my own uh, insecurities would be the best word. Fear is the root, though, is the word I was looking for. I had to press past the root of fear in order to do what God wanted me to do. But I don't deal with that any longer. Why? It's not because I'm older. It's because of experience. And you don't get experience unless you do something. And the word in James says, faith without works is dead. So if we say we love like God loves, and we say that we love people, and we say that we're praying and believing for God to touch the world, but yet we're not walking out and getting involved, faith without works is dead. So it requires us getting up and doing something. It requires repentance. It's the redirection of your feet <laughs> and go in the wrong, different direction. So I, I said all that about repentance because it's important concerning what we're going to read uh, tonight. I want to go back to Genesis 16, verse 6 real quick. So Abram, who later became Abraham, said to his wife, Sarai, which would become Sarah, indeed your maid is in your hand, do to her as you please. Now he knew his wife was upset, hostile. She was in that state of mind. He said, deal with her as you please. And when Sarai dealt hard, then Sarai dealt harshly with Hagar. And Hagar fled from her presence. I, I talked earlier this morning, if you didn't catch the program, uh, go back and watch it. But I, I, I talked about men being the head of the household and the failure here of Abram to intercede and say, don't deal harshly. This is how I want you to deal harshly. Or, or this is how I want you to deal with her. But he didn't do that. He, he should have said, absolutely not. I'm not going to go into my handmaid. That's adultery. That's sin. I'm not going to do that. But he did. And listen, let me just share something with you. Uh, I believe Genesis 16 and this story, it came prior. I, I, I've got to check real quick, but I believe it came. Somebody send me a comment. I believe that this scripture was pre-law, pre the Ten Commandments. Okay? So they didn't have a law to look at. They're still committing adultery, but understand they looked at things a little differently prior 
to the Ten Commandments or the law coming. Repentance and leadership are incredibly important for you and I to develop in our character. As I said, repentance is a change of heart, change of mind, but here it is obvious that leadership is absent. Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting. God calls us to be leaders. Why? To impact the world from wherever you are. You see, so often we say, if I had this, if I had that, I can impact the world. You, you need to start where you are. What is in your hand, God asked Moses? The rod, the stick that you gave me. Throw it down. Give it back. Now pick it back up. God used Moses to defeat the armies of, of Pharaoh, to drown them in the Red Sea, to lift his hand to part the waters. It was a stick but God wanted him to use what is in his hand. I ask you tonight, what's in your hand? You got a phone in your hand. You could send somebody a lovely greeting tonight, encouraging them. Let them know you're praying for them. You could do better and even call them. Maybe somebody you haven't talked with in a while. Maybe you have a relationship with a family member or a loved one that it's been fractured and you're sitting there waiting for the other person to make the call, make the text. The holidays are coming and there's such stress. What should I do? Well, you can be a follower or you can be a leader. And a follower will just sit and wait for something to happen. But a leader makes things happen. I hope you're following me tonight. In this instance, Abram was a follower. He wasn't a leader. Now, the funny thing about you and I, and I stated earlier that God's called us to be leaders, to develop you as a leader. How does that happen? It begins in our character, and it's produced in and throughout our life in every aspect and area of our life. But leadership here was obviously absent. God's called you to be a leader. He's called you to be an impact person, to impact the world. How do you do it? You start at the gas station, the grocery store, the bank line. You start in the morning by saying, Holy Spirit, take my life, use me, lead me, guide me, guard me. Help me to be sensitive to the opportunity that you have for me. And he will do the rest as you follow him you will be a leader. See, God's called us to be leaders, but we're also followers. You can't be a precise leader as far as the type of leader that God wants you to be unless you are a follower. Now, I'm going to tell you, as a pastor for nearly 30 years, being in ministry, God's allowed me to be in leadership positions. The stronger your following relationship is with God, the more effective your leadership role will be. A leader wants to be impactful, wants to be effective. How as believers will we bring that to pass? By being a better follower than you are a leader, but a follower of Christ. Not a follower of the fads, the fashions, what's going on in the latest thing. What's that church doing? How are they growing? It's to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you along the way in the process of that journey that will last the rest of your life, there are moments of God humbling us, breaking us, maybe even feeling a little embarrassed in some situations but acknowledging your weakness and your failure in order to bridge the gap that has been created through the fracturing of your relationship with whomever you're dealing with, if that is the case. 
you may have to, I know the Bible says, you know what the Bible says? It's interesting. People are offended all of the time. You have the offender and you have the offendee. Here an offense takes place, both believers, both Christians, and it appears that the person who initiated the offense is not even bothered or troubled by what they did. It's like they, they continue to go on. And here the offendee is hurt, harmed, and is struggling. The Bible says that when you pray, when you pray and you feel that your brother has an issue, a problem, a difficulty because of something that you've done, you're to leave your gift at the altar and approach that brother. Now, how many people have done that? I've, I've had people offend me. I've gotten over it because I know the process of casting all of my care upon him. I know the process of looking at a situation and allowing the Holy Spirit to show me something of value and worth that I actually have forgotten the offense and remember the treasure that I got from that offense. Oh, my friend, men spend their life digging for treasure, for gold, for precious, costly gems that are hidden either beneath the surface of the ocean or in the depths of a mountainous range. They spend their entire life trying to uncover something that is hidden. Can I tell you something? In the darkness of a tragedy, in the darkness and hiding of something that has taken place, there is a treasure in every one of them. And the question is not, God, are you going to give it to me? It's whether or not you will go after what belongs to you. Ah, oh. ooh, the Holy Spirit is taking a little different turn right here. Yeah. When we are offended, I'm on. This. We're offended. And we look at that offense. And it seems and appears nothing is going to happen. We make the choice allow the Holy Spirit by asking Him to reveal the treasure the hidden offense, this problem, this weakness, this struggle, this difficulty, this pain. He will reveal that hidden treasure that is in the depths of that. But it's up to us to allow him to do that. If we don't do that, and this is what the Holy Spirit spoke to me just a moment ago. When we hold an offense, allow it to grow and fester and develop, what it will grow into is a root of bitterness. Listen to me tonight because this is how important it is to get rid of bad seeds. Because bad seeds produce bad things. And an offense is something that not only is a bad seed, but it is something that will grow and develop into a root of bitterness. You don't need that, nor do you want that to be in your life. Why? Because as we do that, it will grow, it will develop, it will strengthen and overwhelm and overtake our lives to such a degree that we begin to branch out into our physical body. 
You know, the Bible says in the Old Covenant that as we regard an offense, it will rot the bowels. Literally cause a physical reaction in our body. Now, how important is it to walk as Jesus walked? Because the Bible says that Satan came to Jesus and he found no root of bitterness in him. Think of that. Jesus was able to relieve himself and release and get rid of all of those offenses, those attacks, those moments that Satan would come against him. And here Satan comes and he doesn't find a root of bitterness. Than him. Now, can I tell you? Let me ask you a question. What do you think Satan was looking for when he came to Jesus? He was looking for bitterness. He wanted to see if what he had tried to do in the three and a half years Jesus was in ministry, he tried to see if attacks old and rooted and grew into a root of bitterness. He was unsuccessful. Can I tell you something? God wants you and I to live that same way, to be offense-free, to say, you know, Father, they know not what they do. Please forgive me. I'm going to pray for them. What is the solution for an offense? To give it to God, cast all your care upon and to, re- and to release them, forgive them. What it does, an offense tethers you to the person. You choose whether you cut the offense and let them go on their way, and you remove that and cast it upon the Lord and go about your merry way. You and I choose to do that. Don't be offended no matter what happens. Don't get into the fight. Don't get caught in the trap. Because sometimes the trap wins. I want to talk about mercy tonight. We're going to end the program with this. In Genesis chapter 16, continuing on with verse 7 through 10, the scripture says, Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, talking about Hagar, with this little child, Ishmael. She had fled from the presence uh, of uh, Sarai, and now this is where she is at. And it says, An angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said to her, Hagar, Sarai is made, where have you come from, and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Now, I want to I want to interject a thought here. Restoration can be painful, okay? Because this is what we're seeing here in this scripture. Verse 9, and the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress. Listen, pick up the baby and head back to Sarai's house. Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I, this, listen to this now. This is the hope that the angel of the Lord gave to Hagar, the mother of Ishmael. See, even in a mess, there's mercy. <laughs> even in a failure, there can be faith. Even in a tragedy, there can be triumph, even for you, no matter how big the mess, no matter how broad, no matter how deep, no matter how far and how long you've you've run from God, can I tell you, he's gone with you. Yeah, you don't have to run back to catch him. You can catch him right where you are tonight. And I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment to get on that bus. Come on, somebody. Uh, so much, don't you believe you in the wilderness? He loved Hagar and Ishmael enough. Why? Because they were a creation of him. They had his fingerprints within them. The gift and the talent of God was knit together in while they were still in their mother's womb. 
And can I tell you, that's the truth not only for Hagar, for Ishmael, but for every person that has ever been birthed and born and walks the face of the earth. God's handiwork and his fingerprints are knit within them. They can't send them away. They can't change them away. They can't transform their body away from that. Can't cut it off. Can't remove it. God's handiwork and handprints are within the life of every person. Now just, I want you to think about that for a moment. Because underneath that confusion, there is a person that God loves so much that before they came out into the world, God himself looked at them, admired them, and gave his very best gift, gave his very best talent, and he knew himself. Any visible to you, he placed himself within every person. Think for a moment. How much does God love the world? He loves them that much to knit gifts, talents, abilities, his handiwork within that little little cell where it was with others oh, think of that it makes me see people differently it makes me look past the sin result it makes me look past the transformation of physical people it goes past that I can see. Now I can see what God sees. See, they can cover up those gifts and talents. They can't remove them. They're deep within their spiritual being, waiting, waiting to be placed in the place that God desires them to be. And that is a place of rest, safety, and restoration through what Christ has done. He said, return to your mistress and, and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude." Now, the rest of the story, what's the result of Abram not going into his wife Sarai, but going into her handmaiden, her mistress, Hagar, having intercourse, producing this child, something you can't erase, can't do away with, Board it. It was a child that God to come into the world. What were they going to do? Often, not often, we always reap what we see, grace and mercy. In this instance, the angel goes on. And he forewarns Hagar of the type of man that Ishmael will be. He should be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man. Every man stand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all of his people. Now, for a moment. This Ishmael... He's going to be beautiful while he's a little baby, so enjoy him. But when he gets older, he is going to be a person that inflicts pain on many people. So 
Sometimes there is a result, and it's a bad result of I'm going to wait. I'm going to up here because I want to pray with you. You may come across this program. You told me the law for this experience or not. But if you think of it, you know. But I believe the law came after this situation between Abram and Sarai and Hagar the handmaiden. But I want to pray with you tonight. Whether you're watching on the live stream or the rebroadcast, something in the program piqued your interest. It wasn't me, it was the Holy Spirit. And tonight or today, whenever it is you're watching this, you sense that God is touching your life and giving you an opportunity to receive him. I want to let you know that there's no other way to heaven and there's no other way to peace on earth than Jesus. It's not going to church. And, and, and listen, those things are important They're in the word. But I'm talking life and death right now. I'm talking now. You can receive Jesus and the forgiveness of all of your sin right now. How do you do it? Simply by inviting Jesus into your life and receiving all that he's done, his payment in full for sin that he did and said it was finished. So your relationship with God will no longer be based on what you do or don't do. It will be based on what he has done. Come on, you're going to be led down the road of things that he's going to challenge you with and invite you to let go of and say, I don't want you to do these anymore. This is the way that I want you to go. And he'll give you the power to let go of that sin, that failure, that weakness that's still in your flesh. But tonight, you can easily receive Jesus. Would you pray with me? Would you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you tonight, I'm a sinner, and I'm in need of a Savior. I ask you to minister to my life. Right now, I receive Jesus into my life. I accept everything that he did on the cross for me. I repent of my sin. I no longer want to be a sinner. I want to be a child of God. I thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave himself for me. Thank you. I receive it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Do you know if you prayed that prayer in faith, you are no longer, you're not a better version of who you used to be. The scripture says, that you are a brand new creation in Christ, that old things are passed away, and behold, all things are new. And welcome to the family of God. Well, look who woke up. Mr. Carter, are you here to say just, oh, you just want to say good night to everybody? Huh? How you been? Are you having a good time? Yeah, are you, are you having a good time? Oh, he's my little buddy. My son's going to be going out of town, first out of town trip with the baby. So keeping him for a little bit, and he is a blessing. Hey, I want to let you know that we have a YouTube channel if you haven't been there. It's at Faith is the Victory Fellowship YouTube. All of our programs are there, and I pray there'll be a blessing to you. You can check out our social media platform, Twitter and Instagram and I think we're on Instagram and on uh, Facebook for sure. Uh, I want to tell you, I enjoyed my time tonight. A blessing with you. And I just encourage you, look up, lift up your eyes because your redemption draws nine. Hebrews chapter 11 or 12 verse 1, I believe. 
I, I sometimes I get those confused. 11, 12. But I believe it's chapter 12, verse 1. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Maybe verse 2. Hey, check it out. Send it in the comments. Let me know. But I know one thing. He is faithful to his to watch over his word to perform it. And he is God. I keep my eyes on him. Don't you, Carter? Yeah, when we first got Carter, he was a puppy. You're going to think I'm crazy. Uh, I led him in the sinner's prayer. Yeah, so I believe my doggy's going to be, it's not mine, but my grand doggy's going to be there in heaven. Now, that might turn you off, but you know what? Whether I'm right or wrong, it doesn't matter. I choose to believe. Amen? Come on. I choose to to believe. I pray you have a blessed week and a restful rest of your evening. And until Monday, right back here at 12 standard time, we will be live on Faith is the Facebook. Hey, we got some exciting news that I'm going to share with you this next week. And I got to tell you, God is faithful. Until Monday, I love you. God loves you. And as always, my friend, never, ever forget, he is faithful.